speaker for this episode is a retired professional engineer from the Canadian Department of National Defense with degrees in bioengineering and electrical engineering from the Universities of Guelph and Queens, respectively. As a researcher and writer, he has been responsible for having declassified the largest group of documents on the Avro Arrow, Canada's advanced supersonic fighter of the 1950s, and also the Velvet Glove Missile Development Program. He has sought to answer the key questions of who ordered the destruction of the completed aircraft and all technical information and why the project was cancelled. His work has also extended into the realm of UFOs and Avro's link to the United States' effort in building a flying saucer. Key documents are reproduced in his best-selling books, Storms of Controversy, The Secret Avro Arrow Files Revealed, The UFO Files, The Canadian Connection Exposed, Requiem for a Giant, A.V. Rowe and the Avro Arrow, and his latest effort, The Arrow for the Record. He has also written numerous articles for various magazines, including Avro Arrow, an aviation chapter in Canadian history for engineering dimensions, and a guest editorial, Rebuilding the Arrow, in Air Force magazine. He has consulted and appeared in several documentaries, including The Sea Hunters, The Search for the Avro Arrow Test Models, which is National Geographic, Indians and Aliens, a six-part series by Revolution Pictures for APTN, Avro Carr's Saucer Secrets from the Past from Mid-Canada Entertainment, and The Shag Harbor UFO Incident by Ocean Entertainment. He has also been interviewed by num- numerous radio and television stations on the Arrow and UFOs, including Jane Houghton Live, The UFO Files, and Strange Days Indeed on CFRB. His book, Storms, was also used as background information for the fictional movie, The Arrow, with Dan Aykroyd starring, as noted in the Canadian Encyclopedia under Aykroyd and the Making of the Arrow. He resides in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, and continues his research into the Avro Arrow story. We do hope you will enjoy the presentation, and due to COVID-19 concerns, this presentation was recorded in the author's home garage. You will hear some ambient uh, noise in the background. We do apologize if for any reason some of the vehicle and aircraft sounds you hear may be a bit distracting, but the presentation itself is well worth it. Well, I'd like to thank the uh, Canadian Aviation Historical Society for affording me this opportunity to talk to you today about the uh, Avro Aero. Uh, of course, I would have preferred being able to do this in person, but under the circumstances, we'll try to do the best we can. Now, if we can begin, we'll look at this first slide. And this is the agenda that I plan to follow. I'm going to speak about AV Row Canada Limited, just a few words. Then I'm going to talk about the jetliner. I want to get into the artifact that was pulled from Lake Ontario a few summers past. And then we'll get into the arrow in terms of whether or not it was advanced, who ordered the physical destruction, and the reasons behind the cancellation. And then we'll follow that up with a look at the cost escalations that occurred in the program and the actual overall costs. And then we'll just have a few final notes after this. Now, as far as AV Row Canada is concerned, at the time of the cancellation, it was the third largest company in Canada behind Canadian Pacific Railways and the Aluminum Company. It consisted of Avro, which was responsible for developing the aircraft and airframes, Orenda, responsible for the engines, and then a number of subsidiaries like uh, the Dominion Steel Company, Canadian Steel Improvements, and, and others. February 20th, 1959, we all know as Black Friday, the day the Arrow was cancelled. 14,000 people at Avro and Orenda lost their jobs. They were released immediately, and about 25,000 in total were affected. The others, of course, were in the various subsidiary companies that, uh, or sorry, in the various uh, contracting companies that were providing material to the, to the project. By July of 1962, AV Row itself ceased to exist. And I just want to point out one thing. When you look at the photos of the arrows, you'll see they're designated RL-201, RL-202, and so on. The RL stood for Row Limited. Now on this next slide, these are the four main projects that Avro was involved with. 
The first two, the C-102 Jetliner and the CF-100, uh, were basically uh, ongoing concurrently. And then, of course, they were followed by the Arrow and the Avro car. So I'm going to say a few words about the Jetliner. The C-102 Jetliner was originally being developed for use by TransCanada Airlines. It was the first commercial intercity jet to fly in North America. It was August 1949. It was beat out by a couple of weeks from being the first commercial jet to fly in the world by the British Transoceanic Comet. The jetliner was used to deliver the first jet airmail between Toronto and New York City. Uh, in fact, the crew, when they landed, they were given a ticker tape parade down the streets of New York. And as far as I can determine, the word jetliner itself was coined by Avro, but they couldn't copyright it because the jetliner never went into production. There was nothing like it until, in North America that is, until 1957 when the Boeing 707 took off for the first time. As far as the jetliner is concerned, there was interest uh, in people who wanted to purchase it from National Airlines and Howard Hughes for his own Transworld Airlines. The jetliner was also flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for demonstration flight testing. And the pilots there were allowed to fly it as they would their normal aircraft. But, it, as I said, it was being developed concurrently with the CF-100, so C.D. Howe, the Minister of Munitions and Supply at the time, decided he wanted Avro to focus on the CF-100 design for the Korean War effort. Now, the, the CF-100 was running into some uh, production design difficulties, so he decided, uh, he being C.D. Howe, decided all work should be stopped in 1952. He ordered everything stopped in November 52, and that was basically the end of the line for the jetliner. It continued to fly for a few years as a corporate jet for Avro, but by 1956, that was no longer feasible, and it was cut for scrap. And today you'll see the uh, cockpit of the jetliner in the Aviation Museum here in uh, Ottawa. Now, from the critic's standpoint, of course, it was said that the jetliner was a very poor design, that it was bad engineering, etc. Et and yet, for all of this bad engineering, or alleged bad engineering, Jim Floyd, the designer of the jetliner, and subsequently the Avro Aero, he was awarded the Wright Brothers Medal for Excellence in Design of the jetliner, the first time it was awarded to uh, outside of the United States. Now, it was also said that it could not be sold, and that the interest that I mentioned earlier from National Airlines and Howard Hughes was just that it was interest, that there weren't any hard dollars uh, being put forward. That's not exactly true when you go into the details. But notwithstanding that, I mentioned that they'd flown the jetliner to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Well, in 2003, I published this letter, which hadn't seen the light of day until that time. And it's a letter from the Canadian Joint Staff in Washington to the Department of National Defense. It's dated 14 August 1951. And the key paragraph is paragraph number two, which says very clearly, and I'll just read it here, it is now confirmed that the United States Air Force wished to purchase 12 jetliners. It goes on to say this board, which at the time was the Aircraft and Weapons Board in the United States, approved the purchase of 12 aircraft, and that this approval was on recommendation of the, all the United States Air Force commands. So as far as being able to say that nobody was interested in purchasing the jetliner, that is not correct. The Air Force was definitely ready to purchase 12, according to this letter, for refueling and training purposes with possible follow-on buys. And as I said, when you investigate Howard Hughes and national interests, there was uh, more than just passing interest there as well. But that's all I want to say about the jetliner. I'd like to move on now to the artifact that was pulled from Lake Ontario a few summers ago. But first, a little bit of background. So, when the Aero was being developed, uh, the engineers were testing uh, small models of the Aero in wind tunnels, of course, and in what was called the Aero Ballistic Test Range at the Canadian Armament Research Development Establishment, or CARDI. They decided that they wanted to get perhaps a bit more realistic data from actual 
flight testing. So they decided to build one-eighth scale models of the Aero. And the idea was they would mount these models onto rocket boosters, in particular the Nike rocket booster. They would launch them uh, from a launch site at uh, Point Petrie in Ontario, which is south of Trenton. This was a, a testing range run by the Canadian Armament Research and Development Establishment. So it had already been used for this, types, this type of testing for other things. So they would launch these models, and when they reached the approximate altitude of about 25,000 feet and a Mach number of 1.7, the booster portion would passively detach from the model itself, and the model would continue on uh, on its course and eventually splash into the uh, in, into Lake Ontario. And through that entire phase, it would be sending telemeter information back to the ground control. And this was all a fire and forget type of exercise. These models were never meant to be uh, recovered. But for the last, for a number of years now, people have been going out uh, trying to find them as part of our aviation heritage. So if we look on the slide, the first five models were, like the one on the bottom left, they were designated crude models. They basically had the uh, shape of the arrow, but not much in the way of features, so you don't see the engine they sell, for example, or the notch in the wing. The remaining models, they built 11, nine of which were launched into Lake Ontario, so that the others, if you see on the photograph, they were very well detailed, and in fact some of them even had movable control surfaces on them. Now, let's look at the model that was raised, or the artifact that was raised out of Lake Ontario a few summers ago. So if we look at the photograph, you know, at first glance, especially when we saw the underwater footage, the announcement was made that one of the models had been found, because there you see the delta shape. It's got to be an arrow. But when you look at it a little more carefully, you start to see other things. So first of all, when you look at it, you have what appears to be a 20 centimeter extension sticking out the back end that has its own stabilizer mounted to it. And you can see that clearly. The wing itself, although it's a delta shape, unlike the arrow, it goes straight edge into the fuselage, whereas the arrow, even the crude models, were all swept uh, wings. Then you look at the fuselage itself, and the fuselage is cylindrical. The arrow, as you can see from the model, or even from the photograph here in the diagram, was a box rectangular type of structure, not circular at all. You also notice that there's an absence of a tail rudder or a tail, tail fin stabilizer. That's not there. And finally, the wing itself appears in this model to be attached roughly around the center line of the cylinder, if not maybe even a touch below. Whereas on the Avro Aero, it was known as a high wing delta, the wings were up above, and you can see that clearly on the models and on the, uh, in the photographs. So the big question becomes, if it's not an aero model, then what is it? Well, let's look at the diagram on the left of that photograph, and there you see this exact model, this exact shape, and it's also mounted on a rocket booster. Well, it turns out that this rocket booster is a Demon rocket, which was being brought in from Great Britain at the time. It's much smaller than the Nike rocket booster that the Arrow was launched from. And the model itself is from what was called the Velvet Glove Development Project. So what was the Velvet Glove? Well, from 1950 to 1955-56, the Canadian government decided they wanted to introduce Canadian engineers to missile, missile development technology. And so they created a project through National Defense um, and the Defense Research Board and the Canadian Armament Research Development Establishment, uh, which they called the Velvet Glove. Now the Velvet Glove, in some circles you'll see that folks believe that it was supposed to be the missile that would have been launched from the Avro Arrow, that it was the weapon for the Arrow. This is not at all the case. The Velvet Glove development was for subsonic aircraft for use on aircraft like the CF-100 and the Sabres. There is some mention in the files that they were looking at 
potential use for the arrow, but that this was going to require significantly more development than what they were originally uh, looking at. And in fact, it was the whole program was when it was shut down in 1955-56, the RCAF had already opted for the Sparrow II missile development that was ongoing in the United States. So this thing was called the Delta Test Vehicle, and this particular one is the DTV number three. Three of these Delta vehicles were built for the GLOVE program. The GLOVE itself was your classic uh, torpedo shape with you know, some fins on it for stabilization in flight, but three of them had the Delta shape. So what's the difference? Well, the DTV-3, which is this one, was launched, as you've indicated, on a Demon rocket booster. Delta test vehicle number two was launched under its own power using its own rocket engine. And in fact, there's even a film clip of this particular launch that still exists and clearly says Velvet Glove uh, test. The Delta test vehicle number one I have not been able to find the test report on that yet, but I have an idea of what it was, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. But first I want you to have a look at this next slide. And here you can clearly see that it says Velvet Glove Project, Air-to-Air -air Guided Missile, Delta Test Vehicle Number 3, Experimental Aerodynamic Configuration. And it's dated 19, December 1954. So there's no mistaking that this thing was a missile from the Velvet Glove Project, and with all of the differences between it and the Arrow, oh, in addition, I forgot to mention, it was not to one eighth scale. Um, there was really nothing from an aerodynamic perspective or even a construction perspective that would be applicable to the Arrow. It was a different animal. It was being used for a different purpose. So the question then becomes, um, well, before we get to that, what was Delta Test Vehicle number one? Well, if we get to the next slide here, take a look at the picture on the left. This photograph was released by the folks at the Canadian Forces bases in Trenton, or at the museum in Trenton, uh, at the same time that they were looking for the underwater uh, models. And again, the comment was made, this has got to be an aero model. There's the delta shape. This one even has a, a tail uh, fin stabilizer in the back. But again, let's look at it very carefully. It has the same straight edge wing into the fuselage. The fuselage, fuselage is cylindrical. And the tail rudder, tail fin, is smaller than that on the arrow. And in addition, it's sitting on top of this funny looking booster. Well, this funny looking booster is actually four Demon rockets strapped together. It was called a quad booster, and it was developed specifically for the Velvet Glove project by Canada Air. So again, there's some differences, there's a number of differences. If you look at the second photograph, I found this one in a book called The 50-Year History of the Defense Research Establishment. Well, this is exactly the same missile, only it's in the down position, and very clearly the caption says, the velvet glove uh, mounted on its booster waiting, awaiting launch. And I can assure you that there is no way that the folks who wrote The 50-Year History of the Defense Research Establishment would have miscaptioned that photograph. So I believe that it is the Delta Test Vehicle number one. So you have some differences in the structure, in the launch mechanism, to the other, the other two vehicles. So the question becomes, is there any connection then of these DTVs with the Avro Arrow? And the answer is a maybe. First off, yes, there were some Avro personnel present at the DTV-3 launch. Their names are mentioned as observers. That's not entirely uh, unusual because Avro at the time was being asked to modify the CF-100 to carry uh, the Velvet Glove missiles, not necessarily the DTVs themselves, but the, the, the main missiles. Uh, but also this was the same test range that they were going to use to launch their models. So why not be there to see what the procedures were how things would, uh, would unfold. But over and above that, was there any other potential connection? Again, a bit of background explanation. Before any models were launched, whether they were the Velvet Glove models or the Arrow models, the folks at CARDI would launch 
high-velocity rockets. And the purpose for this was to test the tracking system at CARDI. So if you could track the rocket, then you had an excellent chance that it would pick up and track the actual models that you wanted to track. So in one of the Aero free, uh, model reports, it actually references, and it uses the acronym DTV, and later on a DTTV. It unfortunately doesn't explain what those acronyms stand for, but what it says is that two DTVs were launched in 1956, again, to test the tracking system at Point Petrie at the Cardi test facilities, but also that they would simulate separation of the booster from whatever it was attached to. Well, they use the term simulation, and here's the, here's the thing. The separation of the booster from the actual aero models was a passive separation. Once they reached the altitude and speed, it would simply break away and fall away. In the case of the DTV-3s, the test report is very clear. The separation was by explosive bolts. So this would explain to me why they would use the term uh, simulation, because it wasn't really showing the passive separation, but rather the explosive bolt mechanism. And the reason they were using this, the reason they were wanting to do this, is because they found that in a couple of the previous tests with the crude models, I believe it was, that the tracking system would fixate on the booster, given that it was larger, and would miss tracking the actual model. So it all tends to make sense. Apart from that, there really is no other connection between the artifact and the Avro Arrow. But I would like to give kudos, for sure, to the team that found the artifact and then raised it, cleaned it up, put it on display at the museum, because it represents an, a, a new chapter, a different chapter in Canada's aviation history, and one which I don't think too many Canadians are familiar with, and that is the whole missile development program. And one other point, I just found out a few days ago that the team now, in fact, has found an actual model, one of the one eighth scale models, or I should say they found pieces of it, but pieces large enough to be identifiable as an actual model. And the indication seems to be, and the concern which we had all along, was that when they hit the water they broke up, and it appears to be some sort of debris field and bits and pieces scattered all over the place, but they at least appear to have found at least the one of them. And that brings me to the Avro Arrow itself. And a couple of questions. Was the arrow advanced? Who ordered the physical destruction of the completed aircraft? And why was it cancelled? Well, in terms of was the arrow advanced, I think most people are now in agreement that yes, it was. Um, we talk about the advanced electronic flight control system, known as the fly-by-wire. Uh, one point about that, I know there are some who are quick to point out that the Arrow wasn't the first one to use fly-by-wire. And yes, that's correct. There was an aircraft prior to the Arrow that had an experimental fly-by-wire system installed for the purpose of testing the fly-by-wire concept. As far as we can tell, the Arrow was the first production aircraft that was designed around the fly-by-wire system that was specifically there for the reason. Um, over and above that advance, we had titanium, the, the use of titanium in the Iroquois engine, uh, not to mention other metals and alloys in the fuselage of the Aero. Uh, many of the electronics were transistorized. Transistors were just becoming into vogue around this uh, point in time. The hydraulic system on the Aero was 4,000 pounds per square inch. Other aircraft were at 3,000 pounds per square inch. And that higher pressure carried its own uh, advantages. Uh, complications as well, but nevertheless, uh, it was an advance which came into vogue in other aircraft later on, and there were breakthroughs in manufacturing techniques and so on. All of this is to say that yes, all of these features were in the aero on the one singular platform, so it had this advantage over other aircraft for a number of years.
But eventually, those other aircraft not only caught up, but exceeded completely the aero design. That's not to diminish the work that was done. The problem is that work was terminated and they were not allowed to continue development. When I talk about you know, advances today, we have fly-by-light, stealth, 360 degree situational awareness, carbon composite materials, vector thrust, and so on. And I can see for sure that if the company had been allowed to continue, they would have been exploring these other areas as well. Not necessarily on that specific aero design, but they might have gotten into other aircraft design, multi-role aircraft, and what have you. So yes, the aero was definitely advanced, but that was 60 years ago. 60 years plus, I'm sorry. Now, who ordered the destruction? I'm surprised that this question still comes up, uh, and I still see the debates that it was Prime Minister John Diefenbaker of Canada who uh, wanted everything uh, destroyed. Others have blamed Crawford Gordon, the president of A.B. Rowe. And yet in 1994, I published this letter that you see in the slide, actually this memorandum, which clearly shows that the recommendation to destroy the aircraft came from the chief of the air staff himself, Hugh Campbell. Now, a little bit of background. When a government department, and it doesn't matter if it's national defense or some other, when they go to dispose of certain things, materiel, they send it to an, a government agency. Back then, that government agency was the Crown Assets Disposal Corporation. Today, it's called GC Surplus. And what it means is you can actually go there as an individual and purchase desks, computers, um, even certain types of military hardware. So what Hugh Campbell is arguing in his letter, in, sorry, in his memorandum to the Minister of National Defense, is that if we send the arrow in its whole state to the CADC, that they can then sell it in its whole state to somebody, and it would be an embarrassment if it was turned into a roadside stand, I believe is the words that he uses. You know, much like the uh, converted buses that you see where you're selling hot dogs and french fries. So he recommends completely destroying the aircraft, turning them to scrap, and then turning that over to CADC. Now, I had discussions with others and whatnot, and other uh, indications actually in the files, that the re part of the reason for the destruction was actually national security. You know, you had the most advanced platform sitting there, what are you going to do with it? So, if it was handed over in its whole state, I very much doubt that it would have been sold to just anybody. It probably would have been designated protected or controlled in some way. But in any event, you can read the letter, or the uh, memo, and you can see, sense uh, Hugh Campbell's frustration. Now, the interesting thing here, of course, is he writes this to the Minister of National Defense. I've basically charted out the entire paper trail of what's going on here. The Minister of National Defense went back to his Deputy Minister. They went to the Minister of the Department of Defense Production. They went to the Deputy Minister of the DDP. They talked with the folks at the CADC, so on and so forth. What stands out in all of these documents, first of all, is the fact that they all carry signatures and not one of those people when interviewed and asked directly who ordered the physical destruction, they all said they didn't know. And yet, their signatures are in all these documents. The one signature that doesn't appear anywhere, and there doesn't seem to be any message traffic, is the Prime Minister himself. And frankly, that is not a surprise, because even today, when they get rid of or dispose of equipment, they don't need to get permission from the Prime Minister's office. You just do it. There are procedures and such in place for that to happen. So, to me, the real question is, why did all those folks remain silent when they were asked? That, I don't know. Now, the documents also clearly point out that, <laughs> excuse me, they were to send the cockpit section, which is Aero 206, and you now see that at the Canadian Aviation Museum, the cockpit session was going to be sent to the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Toronto. Uh, 
Now, there were theories that it was spirited secretly out of Avro in the dead of night. Uh, there was talk that it was actually sent to the National Research Council. It was neither of those things. It went to the Institute of Aviation Medicine in Toronto, full stop. And then from there, ended up being sent here to the museum in, um, in Ottawa. Now, in fact, there was an offer made to the National Research Council for all five of the aircraft, should they wish to use them for test purposes, experimental purposes, what have you, and the NRC declined for a number of, number of valid uh, reasons. Um, I can assure you, I think anyways, that if the Prime Minister had ordered this destruction, that offer to the NRC would never have been made, nor would we still have that cockpit section that was specifically sent to, to Toronto. Offers were also made to Great Britain, but they were never really amounted to very much. So that is the story on the destruction. As I say, I've outlined the entire paper trail as I found it. And it brings me to the next question. Why was the arrow cancelled? Well, the prevailing argument has always been that it was cost. Specifically, that the arrow was far too rich for Canada. It was unaffordable. And people have said, do the math. Well, guess what? We're going to do the math. But first, I want to get through some of this background information. We know that October the 4th, 1957, when the arrow was rolled out, the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik satellite. And this gave credence to what at the time was being called the missile gap. Now, I'm just going to back up a moment here, a little bit of background information. In 1954, as the arrow was under development, we had what was called the bomber gap. That is, that the Soviet Union was so far in advance of bomber development, supersonic aircraft, uh, etc., that more money was actually put into the Aero program in order to accelerate it. And that injection of money, and they went from uh, building two aircraft to a contract for eight with another uh, 29 to follow, so a total of 37 pre-production aircraft, of course, that gave the impression that the costs were skyrocketing, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But the point is, the missile, the bomber gap helped accelerate the program. Well, now, here we are in 1957, and they're already talking, they, folks in the United States primarily, of a missile gap. And the launch of Sputnik helped spur that on, and of course, the launch of the second Sputnik, which was later on in December, uh, helped solidify you know, this possibility that the Soviets were indeed way ahead in missile development. If they could put a satellite in orbit, then they could land an atomic bomb anywhere on the North American continent. That was basically the, the argument. So let's look at January 23rd, 1958. The Minister of National Defense is asked in the House of Commons, what is the fate going to be of the era? And here is what he says. He says, the future of that aircraft will depend entirely on the nature of the threat. The matter is constantly under examination, and as long as the threat exists, and that threat being the bombers, development and production of the CF-105 will proceed. Now, if you look at that very carefully, nowhere in there is he talking about affordability. In fact, by 1958, a considerable amount of money had already been spent on the Aero project. They had also seen a lot of the cost escalations that we're going to get into. And they had a pretty good idea of what it was going to cost downstream to finish. And yet, none of that is addressed. He focuses specifically on the changing threat. Okay, bearing that in mind, let's move forward in the timeline. We're now January 30th, 1958. Um, our ambassador, Canadian ambassador, Norman Robertson, he's speaking to the Secretary of the Air Force in the United States, and he says, in terms of the CF-105 development, that it was related to the evaluation of the manned bomber threat, the state of development of newer and superseding weapons, and indeed, whether it makes sense for us to commit such a major portion of our resources and money to a weapon system which could become virtually obsolescent by the time it is operational. Well, let's examine that for a minute. First of all, when he says become obsolescent, 
he doesn't mean from a technology perspective. He clearly says, as a weapon system. Well, the reason for that obsolescence is if your threat has disappeared or is on the verge of disappearing, then your defense against it becomes obsolete because they now have something else that they're going to attack you with, which was the new and superseding weapons, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, and folded into that is the Bomark. Now, the Bomark was an anti-aircraft missile, but it adds into this whole issue of what's going to happen to the arrow. So, again, he's not talking affordability or being too rich for Canada. He's basically saying, why are we spending the money on this thing if it's not going to be useful? Okay, let's move forward in the timeline in this next slide. We're now at August 28, 1958. The Chiefs of Staff have put together a very comprehensive report on the entire Arrow program. And in that report, they have this statement where they say that the Chiefs of Staff have great doubts as to whether a limited number of aircraft of such extreme high cost would provide defense returns commensurate with the expenditures in view of the changing threat and the possibility that an aircraft of comparable performance can be obtained from the United States production at a much lesser cost. So let's examine that statement. The piece at the very end, yes, of course, you can get American aircraft that were uh, much less expensive, but they were not comparable, and that shows through in all of the documentation, uh, in the reports and the analyses that were done in, in regards to the Arrow and, and American aircraft. But the key is in the opening statement, where they say that they have doubts that a limited number of aircraft, yes, they recognize the extreme high cost, but they link it to getting a return on that investment. Today, we basically call that bang for the buck. So if you're going to be spending a lot of money, they want to be spending it on something that's actually going to give them something in return. And right now, because of this changing threat argument, they don't think that that's going to be the arrow. So they're not saying in here that it's going to bankrupt the army, it's going to bankrupt the navy, or it's going to bankrupt the country, or some other such thing. They're simply saying, why are we spending so much money on something that is going to be useless, in their view? They recommend, in that report, abandoning the Aero program and bringing in the Bomark missile. Now, I mentioned the Bomark is an anti-aircraft missile, so it will take care of whatever remaining bomber threat there might be, at least in the minds of these folks. And this is a point in time before the United States had agreed to pay two-thirds of the cost of the Bomark installation. So they're now looking at the full cost of the Bomark and its related semi-automatic ground environment on top of the Avro Aero program. And at least one general put in writing, we can't afford both systems. Well, you can't afford both systems, which one's going to go? The one that's going to go is the Aero because the threat supposedly has changed. That whole Bomark thing also brings in the defense sharing arrangements, the NORAD defense plan, which the Minister of National Defense felt obligated, uh, that Canada was obligated to follow. But these are all related uh, factors, the big one being the change in threat. Now on this next slide, <coughs> this is from a document produced by the Central Intelligence Agency back in March of 1957. And I referenced this particular report because they had predicted in that report the launch of Sputnik uh, several months later. But in this particular slide, they were projecting the number of ICBMs that the Soviet Union might have. So they were saying that by 1960, they'd expected 100 missiles, by 61, 300, by 63, 500, and so on, 700, 800, uh, on up the line. And these are coming in at a time when the arrow is going to be coming into service. So you can start to understand that if this information was shared with their Canadian counterparts, and we know that it was, or at least something along these lines, you can begin to understand a little bit about why they decided that missiles were the big threat. So let's move along in the timeline again. On this next slide, we're now into September of 1958. Finally, we have some comment from the Minister of Finance, 
Donald Fleming. And he's the guy that knows how much the arrow has cost and what it's going to cost. And what he says in cabinet, in his meetings, that in considering matters of defense, he naturally put the safety of the country ahead of finance. When it had been recommended a year ago, this is 1957, they're talking, that the CF-105 be continued, he supported the recommendation. And again, I remind you that by 1957, they had already seen a lot of the cost escalations and they knew. They had a pretty good idea of what things were going to cost and how much had already been spent. But then he goes on and he says, now, however, the military view was that the program should be canceled. More important, the military authorities had now decided that the aircraft was not necessary. Again, in this same discussion, he does say that he expects that the arrow might cost upwards of $400 million over the next three years, and that that money could be better spent elsewhere. But he doesn't seem to see it as an issue. He's focusing again on the military and the fact that they're saying they don't need the arrow. That harkens back to the August uh, report, which harkens back to what Robertson had said, which was back to what the Minister of National Defense had said. So again, they're not talking affordability here. And as I said, he's projecting 400 million over the next three years, which is a lot of money. I want you to remember that number because I'm going to get back to it when we actually do talk about costs. So that's September of 1958. Moving on in the timeline, in the next slide. Now we're at February the 6th, 1959, 14 days uh, or so before the cancellation. Top secret memo from the Chiefs of Staff, again. And here they say that they are still of the opinion that the changing threat and rapid advances in technology, particularly in the missile field, along with the diminishing requirement for manned interceptors in Canada, create grave doubts as to whether a limited number of aircraft of such extreme high cost would provide defense returns commensurate with the expenditures. They basically repeat exactly what they said in August of 1958 that we're spending a lot of money on something that we don't think we're going to get a return on our investment. As I say, this is 14 days prior to. They repeated the statement a few days, uh, a few days later in, in yet a, another uh, memo. So again, they're talking bang for the buck. And I would point out here that even though they keep saying the Chief of Staff, Hugh Campbell, the Chief of the Air Staff, was not on board with this. And he produced his own memos uh, stating that he needed either the Arrow or aircraft comparable to the Arrow uh, and talked about the great advances in the Arrow, etc., etc. So he really wasn't on board, even though they say the Chiefs of Staff. So we just have to keep that one in mind. But we'll move on. What about the Prime Minister? Well, to find out what the Prime Minister had to say, I actually had to go a year in advance. So I'm now at February 6th, 1960. And suddenly they're talking about airplanes again. And here's what it says, and again, this is all documented. The Prime Minister thought the public had been convinced of the wisdom of the decision to cancel the arrow. To obtain other aircraft now, in the face of statements that the threat of the manned bomber was diminishing and that the day of the interceptor would soon be over, would be most embarrassing unless a reasonable explanation could be given. He had been against canceling the arrow, but had been persuaded otherwise. So here again, let's look at that very carefully. It says he had been persuaded. If the Minister of Finance came to me and said, this thing is going to bankrupt the country, or it's going to bankrupt the Army or the Navy, or it's going to cause some sort of recession, etc., etc., it's going to you know, increase taxes, I wouldn't need much persuasion if I was the Prime Minister. And I certainly wouldn't be embarrassed about going to the public to say, yeah, we have to do it because we couldn't afford it, and yes, now we have to get something less expensive. But none of that is in here. He's talking strictly about the diminishing requirement that the interceptor era was over, and now all of a sudden we're back to square one saying we have to purchase after all. In his memoirs, he says that he's got a, a one-liner in there after he talks about the costs and such. He says, however, the issue was decided finally by the inability of the Chiefs of Staff to report any new military developments that would justify the arrow's production. So I get the impression that if the military in 1959 had come back and said, you know what, we're wrong about that bomber threat, we would have seen arrows being produced. 
but we don't get that. And as far as him being against canceling the Arrow, according to George Perks, at least, in interviews that he gave after the fact, of course, um, he did support that statement that Defen Baker was reluctant to cancel, so you can take that in for what it's worth. Well, let's move forward a little bit more in the timeline. So now we're July of 1960, and the very opening sentence of these cabinet minutes, it says, the Minister of Defense Production said that at the meeting of the Canada-U.S. Committee on Joint Defense, the U.S. Secretaries had affirmed that interceptors would be needed for the defense of North America for several years ahead. Go to paragraph B on that same document, uh, 8B, and it says, the U.S. were now re-emphasizing the bomber because in their own experiences, missiles have not developed to the extent expected and presumably the USSR was running into similar problems in its missile program. In fact, it was said in Montebello that only five U.S. ICBMs were operational. This was quite a different figure from that which the Prime Minister had been given in Washington in June. So much for the missile gap. But what's key in here is that we were given this information, it was accepted by the Canadians, and we lost a perfectly viable industry as a result. Why the Americans gave us incorrect information? Did they know it was incorrect? Was there something else? That's all speculative. The facts are the facts. We took that information and industry was lost. So with that, I'd like to get into the cost escalations. On this next slide, you'll see it says that the costs, people were saying that the costs were skyrocketing out of control, that there was incredible mismanagement in the program, that there were numerous delays as a result. And then, of course, is what I call the expanding scope. First they had to build the airframe, then they threw in the engine, then the fire control system, then they took on the Sparrow missile development after the, the U.S. Navy abandoned the development. And so the logical statement has been made that they should have stuck with getting the engine, getting the fire control and weapons elsewhere as originally planned. That's not a bad idea, except, like everything in the Arrow, the devil is in the details. I will explain. We look on the next slide. So they start in 1953, and they're going to develop, they're told by the RCAF, to develop around the RB-106 Rolls-Royce engine. Avro does this, and they work at it. 1954 comes around, and the RCAF comes back and says, you know what, that RB-106 development is not going very well. It's not going to be ready in time for the Avro Aero. So forget that and start building around the Curtis Wright J67, an engine from the United States. Okay, well now they have to set aside everything that they've done up to that point, or a lot of it, and restart. Delay, cost increase. So now we're doing the, the Curtis Wright engine. The RCAF comes back in 1955 and says, you know what, the Curtis Wright J67 development is in trouble. In fact, that one I believe was cancelled outright. We don't have an engine. So it's incorrect to say they should have stuck to the original plan and, get, and got engines somewhere else. Now they don't have an engine. Well, the RB106 and the J67s were developmental. They weren't off the shelf, as we like to say. And all the other engines were underpowered. Well, this is when Arenda steps in and says, we've already spent $9 million developing the successor to the Arenda series, which was a highly successful engine, and we can show you a demo. And they do a demonstration, a static test demonstration in the lab, and the engine produces an incredible amount of power, more than enough for the arrow. And this is when the RCAF looks at it and says, that's the engine that we're going to go with. And that's how the Iroquois was born. It was called the PS-13 up to that point. But now they, now they have an engine, and so they're developing this. But it gets better again. They come back in 1956, and they say, well, you know what? We want the first five aircraft to fly with the Pratt & Whitney J-75 engines. 
And the reason for that is, even though the J-75 is underpowered, it will at least give us a chance to fly the platform and test out all the various systems and subsystems and so on and so forth, so that, you know, once the Iroquois does come into force, we're good to go. So again, in each case, the engineers have to go back and rework. And why is that? Well, here's the facts. Engines come in different sizes, different weights, different power outputs, different mountings to the fuselage, three-point versus four-point. And Jim Floyd himself wrote in his paper of 1958 that every time they changed an engine type, they had to rework the entire air conditioning system because it was dependent on the pressure ratios of the particular engine type. Don't ask me about pressure ratios, I'm not an engine designer, but I'm going with what Jim Floyd had to say. So it's not just a matter of is that engine going to fit in the hole that we're producing for it, but you've got to look at the impact on the power, the electrical system, the air conditioning system, um, you know, the weight distribution, etc. Everything has to be re-examined. What does that do? Time delay, cost increase. So all of these things are impacted, and that's why we're getting cost escalations. But it gets better again. We'll go to the next slide. And here we're talking about the fire control and the weapons. So Avro starts out in 1953, they're told to develop around the Hughes fire control system and the Falcon missile. This is what they do. But in 1956, the RCAF says that they've come up with a new fire control system called Astra, and they've given the contract to RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, a company that has very little experience in uh, fire control system design. And in the space of a year, from 1957 to 58, the projected cost of Astra jumps from 72 million to 208 million. That's why that system was cancelled in September of 58. But in the meantime, from 56 to that point, this is what they're working with. Well, Astra is larger physically, it has greater power requirements, and it has a larger radar. So the radome has to be altered. Again, they have to go back and rejig the calculations and the structure and so on to accommodate this thing. So in 58, Astra gets cancelled. They bring, bring back the Hughes fire control system and the Falcon missiles. And this time, finally, things work out to their advantage. And Hugh Campbell writes in his letter to the Chief of the Air Staff, uh, the Chief of the Air Staff, he writes in January 1959 to the Minister of National Defense, that with these changes, the cost of the aircraft has come down significantly, and the date of introduction of the Arrow has changed from 1962, moved forward to September of 1960. So, in this case, yes, it was a good idea if they had only stuck with the Hughes fire control to begin with. Now, they still have to rework the calculations to bring back the Hughes system and the Falcon missile. So they still lost a little bit, but they gained more than they lost. The other thing that I would mention here is that while all this is happening and they're going backwards and redoing things and going backwards and redoing things, salaries are increasing, as is the cost of the materials. That's just a natural occurrence over time. There's one other factor that comes into it, and that is that at one point, the work that was slated for the following year was actually moved forward into the present year, necessitating a request for more money. So that gives the illusion of a, a cost increase, but in fact it's going to help you in the long run, uh, because it's, it's going to result in a lower cost. Finally, the other factor that comes into this was the number of aircraft. As I said, in 1953 they were going to produce two prototypes, but then that went to eight with a contract for 29 more. So that, of course, caused a major increase, and that part of it was influenced by the bomber gap in order to help accelerate the program. The more aircraft you have for uh, pre-production for test purposes, you can run different tests in parallel rather than in series, so your time frame for testing is reduced. Your time to introduction of service is also uh, moved forward. So that's the scoop on the cost increases, and I should say that these cost increases are documented in the files, and I've talked about many of them in the book. Uh, 
Well, that brings me to the actual costs involved. What did it cost? Well, let's look at this next slide. And yes, there's a lot of information here, but we have to go through it. So in 1953, they were going to build two prototypes for roughly $27 million, 26.9, etc. And they were going to purchase 600 more aircraft for $2 million for a total cost of roughly $1.2 billion. Now from summary audit records, we see that up to February 20th of 1959, the cancellation, the government had spent $318.6 million. To complete the development and provide for 30, the 37 aircraft that we've mentioned in the past, that was going to cost an additional $257.8 million. Now, I have in brackets here that 20 of these 37 were pre-production. Well, initially, they were supposed to all be pre-production, but as things moved forward and the testing was going well, etc., they realized that they were only going to need 20 to be pre-production aircraft. So 17 were going to be actual production aircraft, which is why later on down, you see that they were going to purchase 83 more aircraft versus 100. So instead of having 137, they ended up with 120. So that overall package also reduces the cost because you, you're gaining 17 aircraft. But just to finish up here, that 257.8 million is broken up the following way. 24.9 million of that was going to complete the aircraft design. And there was still 40 million in the contract. So the arrow would have been completed. And I'm presuming that a lot of that money was in reworking the fire control system and then there would be the follow-on testing. 53 million of that 257 was going into completing the Iroquois engine design. And the balance was going to be for the 32 other aircraft. And we know that most of the materials were already purchased and on hand waiting to be assembled. So then according to the summary record, as I said, they only were going to purchase 83 more aircraft. But these were going to cost $3.75 million for a total of 311. Now, I've said here, including tax, the letter that I've reproduced from Avro to the Minister of National Defense clearly says that we will sell you the airplane for $3.5 million. So I'm guessing the $3.75 must have included a tax portion in there. In any case, let's go with the bigger number, 3.75 and we're looking at 311. So when we look at the subtotals, 257 plus the 311, we're roughly around $569 million to complete the complete uh, design and have your 120 aircraft. If we add in the 318.6 million that had already been spent, that money's gone, okay, that brings us up to 887. Compare that to the 1.2 billion back in 1953 when nobody seemed to think 1.2 was that big of a deal. So the uh, audit report goes on and says, well, okay, we still have to have missiles, spare parts, and support equipment to the tune of another 223 odd million dollars. So that now brings the total to 1.1, still less than the 1.2 from before. So the actual total remaining to complete everything, including the spares, support, and the missiles, etc., is roughly $792, $793 million. Uh, broken out over three years, that's roughly $264 million per year. Now remember, in brackets here, I've indicated that back when Fleming was doing his calculation in September of 1958, he was projecting $400 million per year for the next three years. Well, that's because the price he was looking at for the Arrow at that time was $5 million a copy, not 3.75. He was also looking at a clear 100, not 83. So we have some significant differences, and yet, with the $400 million for three years, he didn't see it as a problem. His concern was that the military didn't find the Arrow to be necessary. Well, here we are at almost half of that. So I'm sure 
this would have been all right as well if, in fact, they had said, we need this airplane. But these are the numbers from the summary audit records. Now, I've got a little note in the bottom here, which I need to explain. At the end of the fiscal year, and the fiscal year for the federal government goes from March 31st to March 31st, every department has to look at the money they have left over that they did not spend, and they have to return that to the government, and then new monies get a portion. Well, in 1959, the Department of National Defense alone returned $262 million. Only $40 million of that was from the Aero Project. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, but at this point I just want to say that that 262 would have paid off that 257.8 for the first 37 aircraft. Now, I know there are some of you out there who are listening to this saying, yeah, but in 1953 we're going to get 600 airplanes, and now we're only getting uh, 100 for that 1.1 billion versus the 1.2 billion. Yes, that's true. But you're also getting the tools, the assembly line, the complete engine development, employment for 14,000 people at Avro and Arenda, employment for 11,000 at the various subcontractors. So you can't just look at that final figure. There are all of these other factors that fold into it, at least from my perspective. The next 100 arrows, we know, would have cost 2.6 million. Compare that with the 2 million that they were projecting in 1953. That's pretty close. So much for skyrocketing out of control. The F-106 was the single, it was the engine, uh, sorry, was the aircraft that they were looking at as a replacement to the Arrow. Well, it was a single engine, less capable, and the cheapest I could find for it in the documentation was coming in at 2.8 million, actually higher than the next 100 Arrows. So that's the tale of the cost. Now, I mentioned this uh, 262 million. Where did that come from? Well, that came from other canceled projects in the department. It came from projects that had overestimated at the beginning of the year, and so they would never were going to spend all of their money. They had overestimated their requirement. It came from vacant positions where they were not having to pay anybody's salary. And it came from position, uh, retiring personnel where they didn't have to pay uh, any salary there as well. So that money, if it could have been re-channeled, if you will, into the Euro program, would have paid for that, as I said, that, that uh, first group of 37 aircraft. It was also money that would have been spent, that, that is the entire Euro project, that would have been money spent in Canada, that would have returned into the economy in terms of taxes, in terms of the employees purchasing homes and cars, etc. And it would have left us with a military aerospace industry. Instead, what we got, well, AV Road disappeared. Canada lost the military industry. 14,000 employees lost their jobs. Another 11,000 or more were affected in associated industries. Yes, just to be correct, some of those at 14,000 were rehired for a short period of time, but then Avro folded. 25 engineers went to NASA, where they worked on the Mercury, Gemini, Shuttle, and Apollo programs, what we call the brain drain and others went to different aerospace companies in Canada, the United States, and Europe. Some left the aviation industry altogether, and a lot who had emigrated from other countries returned home. So the impact was quite significant to the various families. And if we look at this next slide, you'll see that about a week after the aero cancellation, 10,000 People crowded into the Colosseum building at the uh, museum, or sorry, the Colosseum building at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto to protest the cancellation to no avail. And as you see in the photograph, there was definitely a human cost. And with that, uh, I'm going to end. Normally now, I would ask for questions. We can't do that, but there are two points that I would like to address. So. If somebody were to ask me what was the maximum speed achieved by the Arrow, I would have to reply that the Arrow achieved a Mach 1.9 in level flight and Mach 1.95 in a slight descent. Now this is different from what's been reported in the past, myself included. Um, a few years ago, a, a report was made public 
of the uh, high-speed run that was undertaken by Spud Pataki, and that report shows these numbers of 1.9 and 195 in a slight descent. But where do the other numbers come from? Back in the 70s, Jan Zerikowski gave a talk, the Jan Zerikowski being the pilot, gave a talk to the Canadian Aviation Historical Society in Toronto. He was asked the question, what was the speed? And he said two things. First, he said NAVRA was not focused on speed tests, so they didn't have a real speed test to, uh, to undertake. But that at one point, Spud Pataki did fly the arrow at Mach 1.98. And as it turns out, it was also reported that he did this in a climb. I had found in, the, in some of the records a Mach 1.96 number. So when I had the occasion to speak to both Jan and Spud together, I asked them about that difference. And they both said that the 1.98 was what uh, Spud Pataki was seeing on his gauge in the cockpit, and the 1.96 was what was being measured by ground control. Unfortunately, this new report that has just come forward was not available back then, because logically I would have asked them, well, what about this? It tends to contradict the 1.98 and the uh, business that it was uh, climbing, and also at three-quarter throttle. Well, to his credit, the uh, uh, the author of the report, sorry, the author of the report is uh, was Ralph Wechter, the, an engineer, an aeronautical engineer, uh, whose job it was was to analyze this data. His son, David Wechter, uh, made this report available, and you know, looked at these calculations and basically uh, has explained why there might have been these differences in all these numbers. But as far as he's concerned and as far as I'm concerned, the report shows that the engines were actually at full throttle, or all out, so to speak, and it was 1.95 in a slight descent as opposed to climbing. The only second point I would like to cover is Arrow 206 and its status. So, Arrow 2, because I've since found some additional information, Arrow 206 was waiting for the second Iroquois engine to be delivered. In other words, one engine was installed, effectively installed, and they were within a couple of days of the second engine arriving for installation, after which time they would have undergone their static tests, followed by their taxi trials and their first flight. And with that, I'll conclude the session and again thank the Canadian Aviation Historical Society for having given me this uh, opportunity to speak to you about the Arrow today. Thank you.